Welcome to a special presentation by the Board of Governors, San Francisco NorCal Chapter of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Hello, I'm Steve Schliske, the Activities and Programs Chair. Today we begin what we hope will become a continuing dynamic, honest, and ever-inclusive dialogue, which inspires our membership to join in. As part of the Academy's national diversity efforts, we are hosting a candid conversation, long overdue, about individual experiences and personal challenges faced by broadcast professionals representing a wide range of cultural communities. These revealing interactions by industry insiders are designed to help all of us better understand what individual cultural identities bring to our business to help discover common ground for continuing discussions and energize brainstorming for more powerful storytelling, which connects with our audiences and with our colleagues in the workplace. This unique diversity project was suggested by the newest member of our Board of Governors. He has worked in local national television news since 1976 and spent three decades teaching college media students nationwide how to openly discuss and then listen and inquire respectfully as everyone shares their personal stories and insights about race and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious cultures, and disabilities. Shortly, you'll meet Professor Bob Rucker and eight diverse and distinguished members from the San Francisco chapter. But first, to recognize and celebrate Black History Month, here's a powerful example of their thoughts triggered by that horrifying incident in Minneapolis, which shocked the nation and the entire world almost two years ago. I think back to the event that started the Black Lives Matter movement, or at least this most recent incarnation of it, which was the murder of George Floyd. And you think about that video, which was just unsettling, nauseating to watch, just the callous indifference to the harm that officer was causing. You see this young man whose life is literally ebbing away as you're watching on that video, calling for his mother as he is near death and just almost the inhuman indifference to his suffering. And I think that you would have to be hard hearted not to have been moved by that. The subsequent um, reaction around the country and around the world actually made me quite proud. I, I know a lot of people were upset as they should be and demanding change, but the, the resulting Black Lives Matter movement that came out of that, I actually thought was a real positive and beautiful thing. I'm sorry a man died in order to spark that. But the, the, the silver lining to that tragedy was it woke us up in a new way. And there was something instinctively that I think we all knew this has happened before, but this one is different. I think without sharing our individual experiences, our personal lives, we're not able truly to bring a diversity of opinion, a breadth of opinion, um, and, our, and our own personal backgrounds to bear. And I think what we've learned over the last several years in journalism, as there's been this really seismic shift from going from a, a more objective standard of journalism, uh, where there's just the truth, and you said this fact, and then you say this fact, and then the, the viewer can decide which fact they like best. For it, the, the world has sort of shifted from that objective view of journalism to recognizing that we are all subjective biased humans. <laughs> we are all also equally valid in our point of view, bringing that forward to the collective group for us to share together and understand what those different opinions are and recognize that things are not always so simple. I've been pulled over a couple of times where I've done nothing wrong but I just fit the description. There's a car that looked like mine. There was a guy that looked like me. There's a person with the same clothes as I had. I have been pulled over and put in handcuffs in front of my mother. Um, and it's always been a kind of a scary situation. I know the police are there to protect and serve, but I haven't always felt that way. George Floyd was the, the reason why so many people took to the streets to protest, but. What really stuck out to me was how so many young people in the Bay Area united forces to mobilize thousands of people, specifically, at least, I think it was in Arizona, specifically four teenagers here in the Bay Area mobilized nearly 50,000 people in San Francisco, in Oakland. I mean, it was just incredible to see how teenagers said, we are going to do something about this. We're going to peacefully protest, we're going to 
raise our voices. We're going to say there's something that's happening here and we want to change it. And we, and this is what we can. This is the power that we have. And they used social media. This is an issue that we need to face head on. We need to talk about it more. We need to have healthy conversations for equality. I think that there are many things that still happen in the workplace as well as um, just in general of really breaking stereotypes and breaking um, just what what we're we're taught or told or things that you see or or just racism in general. There was a television station here in the Bay Area uh, that had uh, had a need for what was then called a news research encoder. That was the name of the position. Entry level, probably seven bucks an hour at the time. And I applied for it. I got an interview. I went in and uh, the manager who interviewed me uh, after 30, 35 minutes of, of, of speaking with them one-on-one, -on -one, essentially told me two things. He says, I don't think you have a, a future in this business. Uh, number two, um, I, I don't think you look like how you should if you want a career in this business. So not only was he making a comment about how I looked, but he also said later, he was also making a comment that you know, I, I think you're Asian, but I'm not sure. Sitting back being a past Asian person, female, and not really getting where I wanted to go, I had to make a sacrifice, which was I left San Francisco and I moved to North Carolina. Most people go, what? <laughs> yes, exactly. I moved to North Carolina for my first management job. And I remember doing that. I have no regrets in doing it and saying it was a way to get a seat at the table. Because prior to that, certainly I had applied for a position at my old station, and I just kind of got the feeling they were never going to give me the nod. It's like the worst kept secret. Everybody's aware of it, but nobody wants to talk about it. And I think it's our job or responsibility to mention it, to bring it up, to share it. We don't tell people what to think, but we help them guide, we help guide what's important. We bring what's important to the forefront. Looking back at programming from years past, and it was largely white males creating the programming, white folks in the programming, um, and a, a lot of people were left out of that process. And you were at a point where that's no longer acceptable. Honestly, I think I'm still working it out. I'm still working out what does it mean to be seen as a brown woman in this space, not just as a brown face saying the news and telling the stories the way that it's always been told, the way that I did as a beat reporter for many, many years. But what does it mean to inhabit the body and the lived experience of a middle-aged brown woman and bring that to my audience? That's new for me and I'm still working through that. You know, when I conducted those interviews recently on Zoom, I had no idea what everybody was going to say. But over the next hour, they'll have a lot more to add as we candidly look at diversity in our profession, because it's time to really talk about. It. Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Rucker. I am that newest member of the Board of Governors for the San Francisco NorCal chapter of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. In a moment, I'll tell you a little bit more about my media background and why I'm with this August group today. But I hope that that very powerful opening segment with remarks resonated with all of you, like they did us. It certainly did for me because it triggered another unpleasant memory. Several decades ago in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I was anchoring a weekend newscast when the general manager in the fourth largest TV market took me aside for some good news. He said, Bob, I'm promoting you to bureau chief in New Jersey with a nice raise, but I'm taking you off the anchor desk. I looked stunned and I said, why? My numbers are good and we're growing. And he looked at me square in the eye and he said, quote, Bob, Philadelphia has a very large black community and you're just not black enough, end of quote. In years to come, I would tell my college students 
that moment in the city of brotherly love brought me face to face with racism in our industry. And it would not be the last time. So I had to figure out a way to navigate it to have a successful career. Because as Walter Cronkite used to say, that's the way it is. Thank goodness so much has changed over time. And today, those exceptionally gifted people you see on the screen that we saw earlier in the video will help us honor and celebrate Black History Month in a very unique way by opening up and sharing their personal insights and experiences. But first, I said I wanted to tell you more about my background and why I'm with this group. And then I'm going to invite all my colleagues here to please identify themselves. I'm a retired journalism college professor and media consultant with 38 years of broadcast experience, including as a TV news reporter, writer, producer, editor, and anchor in Des Moines, Iowa, New York City, and Philadelphia, and a national news correspondent based in San Francisco for CNN. I'm African-American, married, and I also culturally identify with both the LGBTQ and the welcoming Catholic and Christian faith communities. I enjoy advocating for people with disabilities, like my younger sister, who was born with Down syndrome and now has Alzheimer's disease. All right, Devin, you're up next. Hi, uh, my name is Devin Feely. I am an anchor and reporter licensed drone operator and a couple of other hats that I also wear over at K KPIX Channel 5 here in San Francisco. Bob and I have known each other for, I think, what's going on probably about 30 years now. He, I was a student when I first met him. He is someone that was instrumental in encouraging me down the path that I've, that I've been on. I've worked at TV stations in California, in New Orleans, too, in Atlanta before returning home here to the Bay Area uh, six years ago. So thank you guys. I look forward to the conversation. Hi, Devin and everyone else. My name is Priya David Clemens. It is nice to meet you. I'm actually a little like overwhelmed by that video right now. It, it took my breath away and I really appreciate everyone sharing so candidly. Um, yeah, I remember feeling after I talked to Bob, like, oh, maybe that was a little too honest. It felt like a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to hear from everyone else as well, so thank you. I'm a journalist and anchor currently at KQED. Uh, one of my first jobs in the Bay Area was with Janice Jin, who's on this call at KTVU as a beat reporter. I am, I've worked nationally for CBS and NBC. I've worked locally across the country, um, Birmingham, Alabama to Southern California. I was raised in America and in Europe. I am Indian by birth and American by passport and nationality. Uh, I'm a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister. I'm a humanist, I'm a volunteer, and I am a generally curious human being. So I'm glad to be with you all. Hi Priya, hi everybody, good morning. Uh, I'm Kevin Wing. I'm a uh, journalist at NBC Bay Area, here in the Bay Area. Uh, I've worked in uh, television news for about 35 years. Uh, I've worn many hats, uh, like many of us had, uh, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes, uh, assignment editor, writer, um, reporter, producer, um, was an anchor in my uh, early part of my career up in Eureka, um, was born in Oakland, grew up in Fremont. Um, I identify, you know, you talk about diversity. Um, I'm Chinese, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. I owe all that to my mom. <laughs> um, and I, I identify with uh, all of those uh, backgrounds. Um, I've, I've worked in this business uh, for the purpose of trying to do whatever I can do to um, help the underdog. Um, if there's anyone I will advocate for um, with passion is anyone who is the little guy, the underdog. Um, those who do not have a voice. Uh, everyone deserves to have a voice. Thanks for having me uh, be a part of the panel this morning. 
Aloha and good morning, everyone. My name is McKenna Maduli. I am the creator and host of Top Story, which uh, is this Hawaiian variety show that I actually created on the NBC and CBS affiliates um, um, for Hawaii News Now and the affiliates there in Honolulu. I've worked in hard news. I've worked as an entertainment reporter for 20 years nationally as well for the likes of NBC as well as MTV and Viacom. I moved home to Honolulu about five years ago. And as we jump into this conversation, I actually I actually created this show because I never really fit in a box and I wanted to celebrate Indigenous cultures, especially mine being a Native Hawaiian female. And um, I'm just really excited and honored to be a part of this group. So mahalo nui for having me. Thanks, McKenna. Great to be with all of you. I'm so proud to have been asked to participate in this panel. My name is Dan Ashley. I'm uh, the evening news anchor at ABC7, KGO TV in San Francisco, a job I've been very proud to have for 27 years now. Although I, sounds like it might be more fun to go work in Hawaii. That sounds like an even better place to okay. <laughs> have fun in the sun. Um, I, you know, I've been, I've been a reporter and a uh, anchor for probably 37 or 38 years. Uh, Bob and I have known each other for many, many years. And I'm very grateful to Bob to have asked me to participate in this. I have been, my first paid job in television news was a videotape editor. I've been a producer. I've been an investigative reporter for many years uh, and, and of course a reporter and an anchor. And uh, it's, a, it's a job that I feel is important and one I'm very proud to do. And uh, when I have two uh, grown sons, I, I'm married and when I'm not uh, working. I'm uh, deeply involved in a number of philanthropic efforts because like Kevin, I, uh, I've been fortunate to, uh, to fulfill the dreams that I've had professionally and I wanna try to help young people uh, fulfill their dreams. So I spent a lot of time doing some charity work, uh, largely serving or helping underserved uh, young people in this community. When I'm not doing that, I'm singing rock and roll in my band and um, it's just great to be with all of you. I'm also from, I was born in Chapel Hill in the great state of North Carolina, which gave Janice Jin her big management start. I like to. <laughs> great to be with you all. Hello, uh, my name is Raul Lima. I'm a technical director here in Sacramento for KUVS 19. I just recently made the move. I started my career in Fresno, California. Um, worked for an NBC affiliate there for about seven years. And moved to Univision in Fresno and then now I'm in Sacramento. Um, I've been in the business for, uh, it's crazy to say, um, going on 14 years. Uh, it just, time goes by so fast. And in those 14 years, I've seen a lot of change, um, both positive and negative. Uh, but I'm just excited that I can see it from the point of view of a broadcast, um, point of view of a journalist. I think we're all journalists in our own way. Um, and I'm excited to be part of this conversation. It's, you know, it's a conversation that maybe you have with friends or in private, and this is the first time I've seen it done in, um, in this platform, in this type of forum, and I'm excited about it. I think that whatever happens, it's always good to talk about it and put it out there because nothing can get solved if it's kept a secret. Thank you, everybody. Aloha from Hawaii. I'm Janice Jin. I've been around a long time, as you can tell. I've worked with a lot of you that are on this little Zoom layout here. So it's been my pleasure to do that. I've actually been in the business probably more than, God, I don't think it's 40 years, but pretty close. It does mean I've been around a long time or that I started my career when I was 10. You can decide. Um, I've been um, uh, in journalism. That's what I wanted to do when I got out of college and I got very lucky. My first job in television was in Sacramento. I was always a producer, as you could probably tell, I am not an anchor. Nobody would ever hire me in that position. But I was very happy to be a producer. And it's true, I did decide I wanted to be in management and I had to find a way out. And so my leaving California for North Carolina is an absolutely true story. Everybody in San Francisco was like, oh, I'm totally aghast. I identify as Asian American, Chinese, and I thought when I went to North Carolina, there would be nobody who looked like me. And what I discovered was that's not true. What I discovered, there is a lot of diversity across America. 
They talk about diversity issues in very different ways, including in Hawaii. Um, I, I grew up in Stockton in, if you will, sort of underprivileged conditions. So I always champion um, the underdog. And I always want to make sure the underdog has a voice and an opportunity. So it's really thrilling. And I want to say thank you to the Academy. I feel like it's my Academy Award speech to say thank you to the Academy for putting this together, because I think this is a really important topic. Great to meet you, everybody. I'm Luz Peña. I'm a reporter here in San Francisco for ABC7 News. I've been with KGO for three years now. And prior to ABC, I was with Univision, Channel 14 here in the Bay Area. So I've had the privilege of doing both English and Spanish TV. And they're both two different worlds. Raul would attest to this. And um, it's been an honor, really, to be able to cross over into English television. I was born in Barranquilla, Colombia, if you haven't been to Colombia. I can give you all the recs after this. Uh, I moved to the US when I was 11 years old and I've worked in the TV industry in New York, LA and in the Bay Area. I wanted to become a journalist because I, I'm very curious. I love the privilege that we have that we can ask people questions and that we can just you know tell so many stories and that people trust us and that we get the first insight into so many interesting things. I love covering breaking news being the first on scene, talking to people and having the privilege of talking to them in both English and Spanish. So that's, you know, that's amazing that I get to do that here. Um, and I'm so honored to be part of this panel. I can't wait to, to see what we both, what all of us learn here. And I know it's gonna be really telling and really eye-opening for everyone that's here. So thank you for inviting me, Bob. Hi, I'm Steve Schliske, the Activities and Programs Chair for the NorCal chapter. And uh, I worked in uh, television for 39 years before I retired in 2019. Uh, I still teach and uh, are the chair, am the chair at Laney College in Oakland. And uh, I've had the pleasure uh, to work with every one of you. Uh, a couple of you I just met in passing, but this panel is a really fabulous panel. Uh, I've had the pleasure of watching you on air and, and working uh, side by side with some of you. I uh, really uh, think this is a special event. Uh, thank you, Bob, for putting it together. Well, thank you and thank you all for being here. It's an honor for me to be able to sit and talk with you this Saturday morning. I also wanted to say, uh, Priya, I agree with you. When I first saw the uh, video that Steve put together, I was almost in tears. I thought, wow, you know, these people really want to talk. Well, I said, okay, I'm just the guy to make that happen. You know, a, a few days ago, I was watching late night television and someone as a guest on one of the talk shows made this proclamation. Well, you know, it was exciting and it was incredible, but the Black Lives Matter movement is over. It's done, we've moved on. I noticed later on social media that some people found that insulting during the Black History Month. Each of you as participants were working in television when we saw that video of George Floyd that went viral and protests that took day after day and then week after week exploding all over the world. Here's a question to the whole group. Everybody jump in. We're gonna start our conversation now. What were you thinking or feeling when you saw that video or when you saw all those protests that seemed to never stop right after that incident in Minneapolis? Priya, how about you? Um. Okay, so let me answer this a little bit differently. What was I feeling and thinking like everyone I think on this call um, and obviously witnessed by so many around the world, frankly, I was horrified and aghast and felt like, you know, th that obviously not in that experience, but that feeling of like also holding your breath and also feeling that gasp and then also feeling seen. Like, I, I think there was a, a piece of me that was like, wow, hey, everyone's actually paying attention to this and they actually think it matters. That's exciting. That's great. And it seems like change is happening. And so where I would take that a little bit, um, just in terms of how we responded at KQA, KQED, uh, which I got to kind of see that from the inside. I started at the station just a couple of months before the pan, uh, a couple of weeks before the pandemic. So just shortly before everything happened with George Floyd over the summer. Um, it, it really changed internally how KQED 
is addressing diversity. KQED has always been known as sort of a progressive organization, um, but, and, and kind of works to uplift voices that are not generally heard in mainstream media and all of that. But internally within KQED, it meant that the 10 o'clock hour of forum shifted to be, which is this call-in radio show here in the Bay Area, it shifted to be uh, California-wide and focused specifically on topics of diversity. Internally, we began a source audit. So for every story that is done now, all of the sources need to be listed and reported back. There's a DEI group within the newsroom. And that DEI group has actually got some chops in that there was a DEI um, uh, uh, manager who was hired. And she began running more workshops and we all participated more fully. Well, she actually quit not long ago. And in part, because there was concern that she wasn't really as supported by management. And the DEI community or committee within the newsroom sent out a very strongly worded email saying like, hey, we've got to actually have a seat at the table. We have to actually have a voice. The person who is doing the DEI work needs to be empowered. And management has come back and said, yes, you're right. We're going to make that person the new hire, you know, an executive reporting only to the CEO. There, there is ongoing change that is happening because of that, those initial sparks of the George Floyd incident of Black Lives Matter. So maybe that, maybe the phrase and the group itself, we're not hearing Black Lives Matter, that rally and cry so much these days, but I would completely disagree that that doesn't have impact. I see it in our newsroom this week. I mean, it is continuing to have ripple effects throughout our newsroom and our coverage. Very good. McKenna and uh, Raul, I'm going to call on you next because I, I was interested earlier when we talked about your views on what's happening in the way it was seen in Hawaii. And then Raul, you told that very personal story in the open that I want to follow up with when you said your, your mother watched when police arrested you one time inappropriately. But McKenna, go ahead. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, you know, Bob, we talked about this and coming from a melting pot, you know, Hawaii is full of different ethnicities. We are multicultural. We And so I remember actually the day watching um, and, and in disbelief, as Priya said, I echo that so much. I think I really, as I watched this video along with the rest of the world, could not believe what I was actually seeing. And I remember on social media, we were, we were all posting in unity um, a black square that said Black Lives Matter. And for some reason, and I had, so I had hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag All Lives Matter, and five people instantly responded to me and said, no, you, no, you are missing the point. It is not at this point All Lives, it is Black Lives Matter, and you need to know. And so I didn't digest, I couldn't understand because I don't see color. I don't see, I come from a Hawaiian Filipino dad and a Caucasian blonde hair, green eyed mama. And so I am right never saw color that way. And then I realized there in Honolulu or at that point that there's a way bigger issue that's happening that I, that we on these tiny islands might not know as much about. And I think the George Floyd situation really opened us. We uh, in Honolulu and Hawaii, I remember we celebrated his life. We did paddle outs into the, the ocean where we threw lei in his honor, where we paddled and we pulled mana and, and pule, which is prayer, and for him to elevate change. And that's, that's what my instant reaction to the situation was and in Honolulu. Very good. And Raul, if you don't mind, could you go and tell us a little bit more you brought it to a personal level because Black Lives Matter was about the confrontations around the country with the black community and the police. You had your own experience. When you saw the video of George Floyd and you saw how people were reacting around the world, tell us more, Raul, what your thoughts were. It was just, an, from my point of view, it's an interesting experience to see this movement, you know, go beyond that state, go beyond our country. Um, you, know, you saw manifestations in, in other parts of the world, in Europe, um, where this is an issue, this is going on. And finally, this one moment sparked this movement that went far beyond what anybody could have imagined. Uh, it, was, it was a powerful moment. I had never seen anything like that. I mean, immense, I mean, remember, we're still inside of a pandemic at this point. Um, you know, it's, it's, nobody knows what's going on. And amongst this, we're, we're having this giant movement where people are really passionate and they're, they're out there, they're, they're showing their faces, they're, they're showing their discontent and it was powerful. Um, I, I, was, I was surprised. Uh, it's not unheard of to see video of, of police misconduct. 
uh, you know, that's that's what we put on our channel. When we, when we see it, we make sure we share it because it's important that the community wants to know what's going on, how it's being held, how the authorities are being held accountable for that. Um, especially working on uh, for Univision, we make sure we represent our community well. And, you know, we make sure that we give them the resources they need. Me personally, I, I mean, I've had interactions with the police. I've been pulled over. I've been pulled over for doing nothing. I was just in, I guess, a bad part of town. I was by myself and the police came and they, you know, turned on their lights behind me, came around and, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Let me see your license and registration. And I, I just couldn't figure out what, what I did wrong. Um, the situation where her kind of affects me a little bit is when I, when I got handcuffed in front of my mom. Um, we were living in, uh, near downtown Fresno and we had just come back from the store, I think. And I was, I got out of the car and, uh, there's a police officer there and he's asking me where I'm coming from. I, I can, I couldn't tell who he was actually. He had a flashlight in my face and he proceeds to tell me, instruct me to put my hands behind my back, uh, to turn around, put my hands behind my back, and he proceeded to handcuff me. And I don't know, I, I wasn't scared at the moment. I was just confused. I'm like, what, what's going on? Like, how, how did I get from being with my mom to being in handcuffs? You know, I just couldn't figure out what's going on. All I remember is my mom just yelling at the police officer. And I was like, oh my God, they're gonna arrest her too. This is gonna be, you know, what's, what's how is this happening? Um, you know, and ended up being nothing. They ended up releasing me right there and then, but it was just embarrassing. Uh, it was shocking and it was scary. And whenever, even today, whenever I, I, I make sure that, you know, I have a hoodie, I love wearing beanies, I love wearing hoodies, but I gotta be careful something. I have to give it a second thought. Am I gonna wear a beanie here? Am I gonna wear a hoodie there? Um, I have to take that into consideration when I go places sometimes. You know, Raul, first, let, let me say for all of us, we're sorry that you had to go through that. And I think it's important to say that to people because it is very difficult sometimes to realize the world doesn't see us for who we are. They see us for what we look like. And sometimes they make judgments. We had a colleague at San Jose State, a faculty member, distinguished researcher, African-American, came in from Tennessee. He moved to San Jose looking for a place to live. He got pulled over two or three times. What are you doing in this neighborhood? Never bothered to ask who he was. He just assumed he was not in the right place. Luz Pena, and then I'm going to come to Devin. Luz, you were very passionate when we talked about how young people reacted in those protests in the Bay Area. Talk a little bit more about that. To me, it was just incredible just to see the power of young people during that time. And like Raul was saying, we forget that what happened to George Floyd was in the middle or the start of the pandemic. It just feels like you know, we were not in the pandemic, but the pandemic has been two years, right? And this was pretty recent. And to me, it was so, first of all, just seeing the power of social media, because those type, I mean, those type of situations with police and people of color have been happening, you know, for, you know, for many years, forever. But the fact that social media brought this video into the limelight where everybody saw it, like you, if you, like there was no way people didn't see it. It was on TV, it was on social media, it was, it was everywhere. People were sharing it and, and there was no way to escape it. And you had to have a reaction. Either you were like, okay, I gotta do something or you, know, or you didn't, right? And I, I feel like a lot of young people here in the Bay Area were home because they, they were doing online school. And I remember interviewing two teenagers who, lived in, who live in Oakland and they said, you know, we gotta do something. And they texted each other and they started mobilizing through social media, getting a lot of their friends, a lot of their childhood friends together and saying, let's peacefully protest. And that grew into thousands of people protesting in Oakland. I remember uh, Mayor Libby Schaaf here in Oakland um, saying how incredible it was that young people were peacefully protesting and they were gathering you know, with one voice. They wanted to make change. And to me, the most, the most incredible part of this was the fact that Yes, they were protesting because of the killing of George Floyd, but also because of everything that they had gone through. It wasn't just George Floyd, this was a tipping point. But for them, it was all those microaggressions. It was all those, you know, those moments where they felt discriminated against. I remember interviewing one of the organizers who said that he went inside a grocery store when he was like 
12 years old and he will, and he told me in the interview that he was never going to forget what happened to him when a a white lady said to the teller you need to stop that boy he just stole something and what you know when when the killing of George Floyd happened he remembered that and he said that could have been me that could have been my you know that could have been my brother that could have been anybody else in my family and I think that that's what people were going through it wasn't just George Floyd but it was all those all those memories you know all those those moments where they feel discriminated against and they said we have to do something and this is the moment where people are listening and this is why we have to raise our voices and do something now and and it was powerful there was also the story of the um of the um this uh white uh, uh white teenager from uh, san ramon who said i'm going to go and do the um the the golden gate bridge protest and she didn't feel like she would be the one to lead the protest. So she went on social media again and she said, anybody in the African-American community wants to lead this, let me know. I have the permit to do the protest in the Golden Gate Bridge. And then uh, Tiana Day came out and said, I can do it. They didn't know each other, but this united them. And, and they did this protest that reached national attention. And it was in so many, uh, so many, um, uh, so many TVs and states, people were just airing this and it was on social media. And, I thought it was just beautiful just to see how young people said we can do something and they did the attention was there and it's still there and I think it was you know we, you saw the power of youth during this and you still see it right now sorry about that that was beautifully said and I must say all of you should be college professors because I would love to have you as guest speakers in my class one of the per persons that I bring in a lot is Devin Feely. Devin, you wanted to say something. And I also wanted to ask you to share more about your ethnic and, uh, and cultural background. Yeah, I forgot to do that right at the top. So yeah. I, I am, I am African-American. I am biracial. My mom is black. My dad is white. Um, and I identify as an African-American uh, man, but my parents have been married for 50 plus years, very much in love even now as a pair of oliweds. And so I, I, I acknowledge my biracial heritage um, and, and the loving relationship that I have with both of those parents. But I wanted to re respond to something that McKenna said and just kind of give my thoughts and my perspective on why it, it, it seems that so often in response to what seems to be a, a fairly simple and straightforward statement of fact that the lives of Black people, the lives of African Americans matter or should matter that people sometimes feel the need or hasten to add that, well, all lives matter or blue lives matter or yellow lives matter or whatever. And I've never, I'll be honest, I've never understood that response. If you take it out of the realm of race, which I think sometimes can you know, be a very charged topic, but if someone just on an interpersonal level told you, you know what, my life, my family, my dreams and ambitions and well-being and ultimately my life matters. In the relationship of friendship, I would hope that your response would be, yes, it does. Rather than, well, mine does too, or everybody's life matters, or you know, all, you know, so I, I've never, and this is this is not at all whatsoever um, an attack on McKenna at all, but I've never understood why people feel the need to hasten to add something to that statement. Why just the statement that Black Lives Matter cannot stand on its own. And I also think about the fact that that's, it, it, it is curious to me that that has become the rallying cry. I mean, it seems such a self-evident truth, but it's political because so often our lives don't or our lives are devalued in some ways, that just stating that simple fact that our lives have meaning and they matter, you know, becomes, becomes this grand political statement. And I think that if you, if you look at it from a wider view, it says a lot about where we are. Just the need to affirm that truth says a lot about where we are. Very good, Devin. I'm keeping aware of time, Steve. I wanted to let you know that. But Dan, I wanna bring you into the conversation. And then I wanna make a transition to Janice and to Kevin to talk about some of the issues about the attacks on Asians in the last few years. But Dan, let's talk again. You and I talk all the time and I enjoy it. You remind me of a college professor. And so I'm gonna ask you to weigh in not only on what Devin and everybody else has said, but I've also asked you to talk about what we're doing 
from the perspective of being a white male? Well, thanks, Bob. I always enjoy our conversations. We do talk a great deal. You know, I think, uh, and let me just backtrack one moment. I think uh, the day we saw that video of George Floyd, my sense initially was, of course, shock and, and anger, but also great sadness. That I said this for humanity more than it, you know, not just for George Floyd. They're just like, God, can't we learn to treat each other better? But I, I really, that night, and we talked about it in the newsroom, I had this sense that it was going to become a much bigger deal, which it did, of course. And, and to the, I don't know who you saw on late night that said Black Lives Matter movement is over. Well, that's a silly thing to say. Black Lives Matter movement is, is uh, about a lot more than protesting in the streets. Maybe that has stopped for the moment. But the change that that started is, is really, in my mind, continuing and in some ways accelerating. Look at all the positive things happening uh, in programming now. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a great deal more awareness and sensitivity. So I think it's a great, uh, a great thing to see. You know, as far as being a, a, a white male, I am a white male, but you know, my my father was born in Cairo. My mother was born in North Carolina, and um, you know, I think it's important that when we talk about inclusion and diversity, that we are inclusive of everyone. That that everyone has a seat at that table because we're all affected by this. And just I, as a white male, you know, I've never been stopped by the police, and this, I've been stopped by the policeman. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but I've never felt. Uh, that I've been mistreated or or a, a profile in that way. I don't. I haven't had that journey, but that doesn't mean I can't empathize and try to understand and, and share some level of of outrage uh, at those things that happen to people of color. So I think uh, I think uh, it's important that uh, all of us engage in these conversations and recognize that that no matter what your ethnic background, we all have a stake in this. And, and Devin, if I, I can just ping, uh, piggyback off something you said about the Black Lives Matter movement, as all of us did covering this story initially, uh, we, we all had pictures and video of, of people making fools of themselves, confronting someone, you know, with a Black Lives Matter sign or, uh, you know, attacking them for painting something on the street, uh, a Black Lives Matter sign saying that, you know, why not all lives matter? Well, they completely missed the point. And, and Black Lives Matter the only word you might add to that, Devin, sometimes is what the, what you're really saying is Black Lives Matter too. It doesn't mean other lives don't matter. It means our lives matter too. And that's what everyone who was critical of that seemed to miss. Right. And because of that uh, horrific scene out of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. so many people wanted it to just stay focused on Black issues. That was the pivotal moment we've all been waiting for. Certainly as an African-American growing up in Chicago, I've been waiting for it. My dad marched with Dr. Martin Luther King and he said, we will overcome, we will overcome. And we were waiting and waiting. And I thought that day would never come well into my fifties or sixties. And then I saw what happened to George Floyd and I thought, wow, that's incredible. But we're not alone in this world for being in the center of some of these cultural issues that, that make headlines for us, but also touch communities. And Janice, I wanna bring you into the conversation now, if you would turn on your mic. Um, you've been talking to me for a long time. You and I have known each other for a while. You've been talking to me a lot about the different cultural standards in Hawaii. So feel free to do that. Talk about Black Lives Matter. But then I really want to transition to what's been happening in the Asian community. So, so I would say the, the initial reaction, obvious for me as an activist, if you will, was to be outraged about what happened in, to uh, George Floyd. And the video was so telling and so upsetting. And I was wanting to see people in Hawaii, because that's my new home now, to be as outraged as my friends in Oakland. You know, and the contrast between the craziness, if I can use that term, in Oakland that I'm accustomed to that would go on for hours. And though violent, I'm thinking kind of right on, speak your, speak your mind. This is really important. Um, and then we didn't see it in Hawaii. And I would ask the newsroom, being a fairly new person in Hawaii, where are the protesters? How can y'all people are not on the street? Why aren't we talking about this? And there was a protest and there was a march as Hawaii people like to do. We'd like to do a lot of marches and a lot of sign waving. And so there was sort of an outcry. 
And I remember the newspaper saying 10,000 people showed up to this event. I saw the video. I did not go. I saw the video. I swear to God, not 10,000. Having come from the Bay Area and seeing protests on Powell Street I, and Civic Center, that's 10,000. There were probably 2,000, 3,000 people. And in Hawaii, and McKenna, you can speak to this and tell me I'm wrong. I'm happy to do that, is to say, in Hawaii, they say protest starts at four to six. Protesters are there at four and at six o'clock, they all go home. In Oakland, they don't go home. They stay up all night long. And, and that's what I was accustomed to. Again, where is the activism? So we talk about this idea of Black Lives Matter because who I think it's because Hawaii's population is not heavy on African-Americans that we don't have that same kind of fervor. But I also know from being a activist, if you will, in my mentally, mental activist, that Black Lives Matter movement gave me an opportunity to educate, to woke some people, to really be able to have that conversation with other news directors and television stations that were part of my, my television company at the time. We've been totally rebought by somebody else. But at the time, I, we had sister stations in upstate New York and in Ohio. And actually, I kind of had to explain why Black Lives Matter movement was significant, not just a riot, what was really behind it. And I remember having to get up and, you know, because it's West, uh, East Coast time, getting these emails from East Coast people saying what I thought was like outrageous, crazy things about how to cover a riot. And I thought, oh my God, I have too much experience in how to cover a riot. So I'm like, I got up and I wrote this nine point, nine point direction. This is what you should do when you're covering the riot. This is what you don't need to be afraid of. You know, they were like, stand behind the police line. I go, no, 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 no. Don't stand behind the police line. Stand with the protesters because you're going to get hurt because why are they attacking the police? To try to put some perspective and understanding of what that's about. So let's transition a little bit to the anti-Asian movement. We are obviously in Hawaii, a whole lot of Asian. We got a whole lot of Asian, as McKenna would say, everybody's a melting pot of every Asian, not just Asian, but a lot of Asian races. I also, in my activism, was a little bit perturbed that Hawaii, from my perspective, was not as outraged as I thought they should have been for what was going on on the mainland. When I would see people in the sunset in San Francisco, old people being knocked down, and maybe because I identify now more closely with those um, senior citizens, that I don't want to be knocked down because of my color. So I was like, where is the outrage? And I remember asking the newsroom, where is the outrage? Are we not concerned of what goes on on the mainland that's happening to, quote, our people? Because that's my perspective. When I look at, we call, you know, district attorney's offices, prosecuting attorney's office, HPD, everybody in the brother, like, how many anti-Asian crimes do we have? The fact that you have so many Asians, they may be all considered Asian crime. You know, some guy, some Japanese guy kills another Japanese guy. That's Asian on Asian crime. But that's that's our that's our population. So it was never perceived to be uh, done with a racial motive. It just was seen to be as a criminal motive. Now there's some discussion, small kind, in like China. We have a Chinatown here that people in Chinatown will say people say bad things, derogatory things to merchants and that kind of stuff. But the anti-Asian movement was not quite what it was on the mainland. Very interesting. very interesting. And I, I want to bring in Kevin now because, um, Kevin, you told a story to me that I'd like you to tell about your grandmother and how that experience with her has affected how you see what's going on in the world today. Kevin. My, uh, thanks, Bob. My, my grandmother, my, uh, my dad's mom, um, was beaten over the head in downtown Berkeley back in the 1980s. She's gone now. Um, and was essentially mugged in front of a drugstore. She was going to the drugstore to uh, get a few things and uh, uh, get some prescriptions, I suppose, right? And uh, 
she was mugged right outside the front door of that drugstore uh, on um, Gilman Street. Those of us know uh, Gilman Street uh, in Berkeley, uh, over there by San Pablo Avenue. Um, and uh, whoever did it, uh, the, the thug who did it, uh, took her purse. And um, but at the same time, um, had her banged up pretty pretty good. Um, I was only in my mid uh, early mid twenties at the time, but I remember how uh, angry I was. And um, of course, how sad I was for my grandmother being hurt and seeing her uh, banged up and having a, a, a bruise under her eye at the time that, that lasted for uh, a while. And um, it, it, it was very unfortunate that it obviously very unfortunate that it happened. Um, but it reminded me uh, then as in now talking about it again uh, you know, some 30 plus years after it happened, um, that, um, you know, there's, there's, I think what, I think what we all need to do in this world is to learn to respect one another, uh, to be kinder to each other. You know, we, we talk about, you know, kindness and, and it's almost a catchphrase these days, you know, the world needs to be more kind. Well, we need to do more than just say that. We, we need to act upon it. Um, we need to do more things, uh, more things like what we're doing today. Um, and we need to keep the dialogue going. Um, we may never see equality per se in our lifetimes, but we owe it to our younger generations. We owe it to our children, our grandchildren, um, everyone who follows us um, to hopefully help them if we can't help ourselves in our lifetimes to uh, you know learn to respect each other better and and uh, much much better um, we, we we have so much uh, farther to go and what happened uh, to George Floyd in 2020 um, un unfortunately he lost his life um, but at the same time, and I think Dan mentioned this, and Dan, I think you mentioned this in your in your open uh, earlier. It uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, Mr. Floyd uh, sacrificed his life, but it spurred a, a renewed um, conversation and dialogue that we have to keep going. Uh, we owe it to him. Uh, we owe it to everybody. We owe it to ourselves. You, you, uh, you make that point absolutely beautifully. That's exactly why I think we need to do more of this. And I'm sorry about what happened to your grandmother. And that's got to be very difficult for your family to have to remember that when we see all these stories on the news. Um, we're going to move on to another area. But before we do, we're talking about Asian attacks and attacks on p people of color and all kinds of challenges that we have to cover in the news. Are there any final thoughts, any crosstalk that you'd like to say to each other before I move on to another topic? We have a few minutes to do this. Go ahead, anyone. I, I do want to mention the um, the conversation about you know the Black Lives Matter movement and then the hashtag All Lives Matter. Um, I had that conversation with somebody with a close friends, and they're telling me, "Well, well, don't all lives matter?" It's like, yes, of course, all lives matter. But where's that movement? I mean, what where was the outrage of all the All Lives Matter movement with George Floyd? What have they been doing? Where's their protest? They couldn't answer the question, obviously, and then said, see, because it's a dismissive statement. That's why they're saying it. They're not saying it because they're representing a, a movement, a group with, you know, with a goal. They're just, it's being dismissive. And that's why the All Lives Matter movement doesn't exist and it's used in a negative tone versus BLM. And just as you said that, I was thinking when my dad was marching with Dr. King, we used to hear well, we shall overcome. Well, of course we are gonna overcome. Why do we need to hear that? Why are black people special? So here we go again, history sort of repeating itself. Other thoughts? Dan? Go for it, Dan. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, well, I think, I think it occurred to me as I'm listening to all these great comments from this very distinguished and very diverse group of people uh, with whom I'm so 
proud to be with and also have worked with so many of you over the years, is this didn't happen really in, in many respects, certainly not to this level, before the Black Lives Matter movement, before George Floyd. These kinds of conversations are taking place, not just here, but in newsrooms all around the country, uh, in offices around the country, not to the extent we still need a lot more, but these aren't conversations that any of us had as a group of diverse people just a few years ago. We weren't having these talks. And I, I think it's an incredibly healthy thing to, to have open and honest conversations and include everyone in that conversation so that we can foster greater understanding and, and take greater action to try to make uh, this a better place. You know, it's never going to be perfect. We, you know, I, I, we, we're never going to have, uh, it's not going to be utopia. That's just wishful thinking. But, but we can always work to make it uh, better and to bring people closer together. And I think these kinds of conversations are vital. And they just, it, it, we should be very pleased, not just with this conversation, but with what's happening around the country. We didn't have these talks just a few years ago. That's absolutely right. And one of the things we all have in common is that we're wordsmiths. We choose words precisely. We time them out perfectly. We, we have impact. We have emotional reactions from television. Television is not, it's not only a passive medium, it's an emotional medium. But I always worry about the words we use, how we describe things. For the longest time when I was in television news as a local reporter, um, a black suspect was identified as so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so. and that used to drive me crazy because it could be someone else that's gonna be arrested later. Uh, I've, I've spoken to someone who's on the black television network recently, and he said, it, sometimes that reminds him of way back when, when on Ted Koppel's old show, uh, we had the Oklahoma City bombing mm -hmm. and the media, I jumped on that story and everybody was doing it live that night. And the suspect was believed to be from a Middle Eastern terrorist. When we all know later when the facts came out, it was a white man from Texas or from the South. What about the words we use and how we can verify information before those words come out of our mouth? Any thoughts? You know, um, Bob, I think in the, to go off of what Dan's comments are, the one thing I always found very enlightening when I, once I moved to San Francisco and actually started working at KGO, of which I've had three lives. So three lives matter here. So I, is always that newsroom was always willing to talk about the issues, you know, just in the hallway, uh, talking at the pod, talking about those things. I think, you know, I'm gonna speak as management now and also as a journalist of responsibility to talk about how important it is that you lead that discussion. Though I think that's a burden that we bear if we don't take that burden to have that discussion, we don't teach anybody anything. You know, it really is very helpful for my life to have moved to cultures that I'm not familiar with, including North Carolina, you know, to understand um, the value, if you will, of why they value that way and be able to have that discussion. But as management to say, capture that value and tell that story, even though the mainstream, you know, nobody wants to talk about whatever. They're not as active as I am. Let's focus on why some people think, if you don't think as a reporter, this is a story, go and do not what you think, do what somebody else thinks. Why is there a renaissance in this? Why is there an awakening? And go and explore it because you're forcing the reporter and the producer to start to look at perspectives that they don't have. If we do news from our perspective, that we're only telling our story. We're not telling the story. I don't wanna call it balance. I just think it's fair. It's sort of that woke moment. Why, why is there outrage? So that was my question in Hawaii was, let's do a story. Why is there an outrage on the mainland for Black Lives Matter? And we're not having a riot in Honolulu. Just not sit here and go, hey, it's cool that we don't have riots. We're just saying, and mainlanders are like riotous. That's not the, the core of it. Our, my responsibility is to challenge that reporter, challenge the producer to make sure one, it gets covered and to put perspective on it. And I think as people of color, the reason why we're in the industry, perhaps all of us is want to give voice, give voice, not to the voices, just to give voice and understand that we all have different voices. Very good. Um, let me do this. Priya, Bob, if, if, if we have a sec, there's something I just wanted to say quickly. 
Um, I, I, I do. I, I do think that there is um, sort of an interesting juxtaposition between these two different kind of social phenomena that we've been talking about, which is the Black Lives Matter movement and the Stop Asian American Hate. And I think that juxtaposition kind of tells you that there's still a gap that needs to be closed. I'll share, minus the names, a conversation that we had within our own newsroom um, in which it was suggested that for the sake of neutrality as a journalist, something that you know is kind of a bedrock value in our profession, that perhaps it would not be a great idea to attend or to be photographed or to post on social media about your attendance at a Black Lives Matter movement. And I juxtapose that against the fact that our station did a half hour special on Stop Asian American Hate on the, on the attacks on the Asian American community. Our reporters and anchors were encouraged to freely post about that. They have hosted events and rallies. And one seems to, you know, to be an uncontroversial statement of, of just kind of plain fact. And the other one has some shading and they're not completely on an equal footing. And I think that's something that we should perhaps examine because to me, they're in essence stating the same thing, that the, that the lives and the well-being and the safety of both of those groups matters a whole lot. And so I don't see the degree of difference, but in conversations within you know, my newsroom, that has been something that has been brought up. Very interesting, very interesting indeed. I'm looking at your faces and Priya, it looked like you wanted to say something a few minutes ago, and I wanted to follow up on your comment about who figuring out who you are and how to be a person from India and yourself, a mother, you told me that you are. How do you become you as you mm -hmm. try to connect with that new world you spoke about? Yeah, I mean, I think this actually is, that is why I was sort of interested in what Janice was saying and certainly what Devin's talking about now. Suddenly, I found myself in the middle of, and as many of you did, in, as sort of in the George, George Floyd aftermath, as being part of this BIPOC group, right? Nobody asked me, but I'm like, well, I guess I'm a person of color, so now I'm part of this group. What does that mean? Like, okay, so I host a show every week. Am I supposed to, like, come representing the people of color? And, and is there some like viewpoint over here that we all have that I'm supposed to bring and, you know, fight the good fight? Like, what does that even mean? Um, you know, Indian Americans, maybe six aside, right? Like we haven't had the same sort of experience. Um, I feel that Chinese Americans have had, Japanese Americans have had, black Americans have had in, in, in many ways, being a woman and being of color has been advantageous to me in this business in getting jobs and that is that's a hard part of of my truth that i don't i feel like i often hear about like how hard it is and how hard it has been um but what i am is sort of desired and valued often by management if i can you know as long as i'm doing the work as well and that's the sort of uncomfortable truth for me to say or to acknowledge. Um, but then when I'm in that position, what does that mean? Am I saying like, I'm gonna make sure that I have Indian Americans represented on my show? I mean, maybe if they're the right person, I do think it means very much that we are constantly every week trying to look for voices that are beyond the ones that are commonly represented to see your stories, you know? So, so as a matter of fact, we're now in sort of this opposite position. When we look at the demographics of who we have on, we're like, wow, we haven't had a white guy on in a really long time. What do we think about that? <laughs> What does that mean? How do we? And maybe that's okay because you know that they've had their voices represented for so long. And um, but but it feels like kind of a reverse discrimination sometimes to me as we're making these editorial choices. Um, and Priya, I think my students would agree, agree at the university when we have a large group talking like we're doing today. Yeah. A large number of white people that are sitting there being quiet, and I I try to bring them into the conversation by saying. Are you feeling attacked or are you feeling like you don't belong in this conversation? And that's a concern. I wanna broaden the conversation a little bit further. All of us have started our careers and whether we know it or not, or, or like to hear it or not, we become role models either in our families or on the air with our communities. 
But I felt pressure as an African-American starting my career, leaving Chicago, going to Des Moines, Iowa, where 2% of the population was black. So I would be noticed everywhere. In fact, someone said to me, Bob, you'll be noticed in a snowstorm. Well, yeah, thank you for saying that. But the bottom line was inside that put pressure on me. I had to live up not only to being a good reporter and show that I deserve a paycheck, but I also had to not let down my community not let down the people that had sent me there. And more importantly, I didn't want to let myself down. I saw Walter Cronkite and I thought I could do it, but I didn't know as a black man, I didn't feel as a black man in my first television news job that I was supported in understanding that this is new pressure for me that you all don't deal with. Can I just add one thing, Bob, because of what you just said? So when you said, you know, you want Walter, Walter Cronkite's job, right? Like, so I went to the network and I worked nationally and I worked as an anchor, but I never thought I would get the top job. I never thought that because I'm like, I'm an Indian American woman. They're not going to put me there. So there are times and places in which, you know, maybe I hear it, but also I think that that's very valid within the industry. Very good. Other thoughts? I think, quickly. I think it's not unusual for people of color to have taken on the mantle of the cause. No one says you have to. Sometimes the community confers it on you. I, you know, my choice to do what I did in my career, as I testified in, my, in, in the tape, was I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to be part of the change. And I realized that the only way I can make change is become, if you will, one of them. I needed to be in a position where I can make change, where I could hire somebody like Priya, where I could hire someone of color where I could hire a white guy if I wanted to and be and have a voice in that decision making but it does carry a burden sometimes if somebody's holding you to that standard or they're saying you're not black enough you're not Chinese enough you're not Asian enough why aren't you hiring more Asians versus you know non-Asians um, I sort of believe in this broad context of hiring of diversity that you want your newsroom to be extraordinarily diverse and, you know, because it brings, and, and to value that voice to say, so whatever, wherever you come from, your economic position, your gender, your social orientation is to go, what do you think about that? How's that playing? How does that sound to you? What do we need to know? And the, the, the diverse of voices brings richness to the reporting. But I do think that um, I said to you, Bob, that Charles Barkley, when he was with the Phoenix Suns, he was, he got all mad and he said he didn't want to be a role model and everybody just put him down in a second because he didn't want that pressure to have to be the role model. So I think there are people, as people of color, sometimes we don't want to be that. Just treat me for who I am. You know, just I am who I am. But I, I, I take it for myself to, to carry a bird, to carry the mantle. Right, and that's a personal good. decision. But consider the fact we've taken on very high profile jobs. Janice, I love that story. And I'm glad that you and I've talked about that because when we've made a decision to be high profile on television, we're also saying, look at me. I have something to share. I have something unique that I'd like to share, but I also want you to understand why I'm sharing it. I don't think every one of us feels comfortable with all of that every day, all the time. Maybe that's me. What are your thoughts? Luz Pena, you've got that in perspective look on your face. <laughs> You know, I think it's interesting what Janice is saying about hiring diverse, um, you know, people in, in, the, in the industry. But I also think about the fact that, you know, as a Latina, you, you, you see my name, Luz Peña, you know, I don't speak, you know, you know right away that my first language is not English, right? And I will never forget somebody in the industry who's white asking me, should I change my last name to my grandmother, great grandmother's last name, that's a Latino last name. So, you know, so I can have more opportunity. And to me, that was so shocking. <laughs> because as a Latina, I know how tough it's been to be in the English industry. And to hear somebody like that saying that they were thinking about changing their last name, which they could have and people do in our industry all the time. Sometimes they don't even have their, you know, their actual last names and they just make something up. But to do it in a sense to get ahead, that to me was just insane. Of course, I knew this had, you know, of course I knew this happens, but somebody asking me as a Latina, considering everything that I've gone through to be where I'm at, it was just so, you know, incredible. So I would honestly ask people like you, Janice, who hires talent to really ask those questions. 
You know, like when you hire an Asian, you know, somebody from the Asian community, where are you, you know, where are you from? Like actually learning the background and understanding where people are coming from. As a Latina, you know, you, you sometimes you watch TV and you see somebody on TV and their last name is Hernandez, right? You know, and when you send them to cover a story, sometimes they don't speak the language. So how can you empathize sometimes with, you know, with that community group? You know, all those questions need to be asked instead of just checking a box of, I hired an Asian, I hired a Black, I hired a Latina. Actually understanding where people are coming from and, and how they, they, um, they're involved with their communities because you want to make sure that you're not hiring somebody that's there just to get ahead at the expense of other people. Very True. good. I don't want to run out of time. So other thoughts real quickly, if you want to drop them in now. Oh, you know, I actually wanted to say something when we're talking about George Floyd, something that I feel like changed in journalism is the fact that we began questioning more what um, press releases were saying and police reports. Because if you think, up, if you think about the, uh, the police report from the George Floyd killing, I, I was actually looking it up when, when you guys were talking and um, it said that at no time were weapons of any type used by anyone involved in this incident. And you read that and you're like, okay, well, you know, why did this guy die? How did this happen, right? And if, there weren't, if, we, if we didn't see that video, you, you wouldn't think anything. But you saw the knee. The knee was a weapon, right? And sometimes you read past this police report and you're just like, okay, well, you know, it's a regular arrest. Nothing happened. But because of that video, everything changed. And now you read police reports and you question things more and you don't just report them like, oh, no weapons were used or, you know, this person just passed away. You know, it, no, you question more. And the fact that now there are also, you know, the, the cameras that police officers are wearing, you also have an actual visual of what took place. And I think that that changed in journalism, that we are questioning more. We're not just reporting what police are giving us or press releases are, are saying. Very quickly, we have a question from the audience too. And thank you, Luz, for those comments. The question is, given you have all covered so many different examples of hate against different populations, do you have a point of view as to what they all have in common? We all have biases, he says, but these examples of prejudice, or for a lack of a better word, must reflect some consistent aspect of the human condition. This is from someone who's viewing us right now. Someone take that on. Devin, you're good at these kind of things. Go for it. Yeah, I saw that uh, comment and I wanted to thank the person for it. I would say off the top of my head, probably the common denominator is not recognizing someone else's common humanity. I think we do that a lot. You know, I think that, um, you know, one, one of the wonderful things about being biracial is that my parents um, in the late 60s, and into the early 70s when my sister and I were born in the 80s, is that they were able, their love story is the story of looking past um, their racial identity, you know, past sort of the cultural boundaries that would have typically separated them. And I think one of the things that we need to do much more of is increase our understanding of other people and other people's culture all the while recognizing that there is a common humanity that unites us all. The things, I've always been of the opinion that the things that unite us as humans are far greater and more powerful than the differences that potentially divide us. And so I think I've always thought that it's not worth it to me to hate anybody. It seems like tremendously misspent energy and effort. And, and I can't imagine that the investment of energy that it takes to hate someone or to hate another group doesn't somehow boomerang back to you in a negative way. So that's, that's what I think the common denominator is, is just we often dehumanize other people and other groups, and we don't recognize that this is someone that too belongs to our human family. Well said. We're running out of time. Dan, you look like you wanted to say something. Go for it. Well, I, I think uh, Devin makes a really good point. I'll just bounce off that for a moment. It, it, to your question about what is it about us, I've often thought that there's something sadly instinctive about human nature that makes us want to divide each other up. I don't know, I don't know what it is. It's really tragic to me. Uh, I just don't under, I, I've never really understood it. 
But if 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 suddenly, you know, we have uh, all of these different issues that we're talking about today. If suddenly there were just only white people in America, if there were just only white males in America, and pick any group, you think we'd all get along? <laughs> Pretty soon it'd be like, you know what? Those blondes really bug me, you know? Uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the short people, they're the problem. And it, it, there's something tragically instinctive about human nature that we want to divide each other up. It's a lot easier to do when there are clear physical differences among us uh, and or clear cultural differences among us. Uh, you know, I hope that we will uh, get past this, but I, I know eventually that we will continue to make progress because we are slowly becoming uh, more and more uh, diverse, and, uh, and not diverse, more and more unified, more and more uh, less divided than we have been. We still have great divisions, of course, but uh, look at our, our society now as even more of a melting pot than it used to be. Now that brings challenges as well as opportunities in terms of everyone getting along. But I just think there's something that uh, we, since the dawn of time, we have not been able to help ourselves, that we attack one another, we turn on one another, and we take sides. It's a shame. It's just the way, uh, it's the way it has been and, and with probably the way it will be going forward for a long time. But if we continue to nip away, chip away at it, uh, maybe we'll get somewhere that's positive. And I, thank you, Dan. And I want to turn to McKenna. You're the eternal optimist here. When you and I talked, I was struck by how positive you are about how what Dan was saying is the reality for you. Talk about that, McKenna. Uh, you know, in Hawaii, we say a lot, there's the Alma crab syndrome. And what it is is crabs in a bucket. And when those crabs are trying to get out of the bucket, there's other crabs trying to pull them down when they're trying to reach up to elevate change, to, to evoke healthy conversations like we're having this morning. And I believe firmly that if those crabs just start to stack each other up and lift each other up, there's no reason why we can't break that Aama crab syndrome. And I think it is a worldwide, I, I call it hulali, which is like reflecting light but I think that when we have this bucket, um, we can change the pull down to the elevation. I, I love the analogy. And this is coming from a guy who's allergic to seafood. So <laughs> I'm sorry. You've been, you've been and I'm in the city. I can't wait to go eat some seafood. <laughs> have my but yeah, I think that's a great, you know, it's a great thing. It's crabs in a bucket. And I think um, everyone here, it's just, we all want to do better. We all want to be better. And every single person here, I just, I'm just in awe of how talented and how many great, beautiful things you all have to say. Thank you. I totally agree. And I want Raul to give a chance to say any final thoughts you may have. And then I want to tell everybody about our next month effort when we celebrate uh, Women's History Month. Raul, your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, I wish we could just have a conversation about it. Um, what makes me upset, what makes me angry is that not only are these things happening, but nobody's talking about it. Nobody's um, having, they're either scared, um, they feel they don't have a voice. They feel they have no right to talk about it. They feel attacked. And I really wish everybody would just, you know, sit down and just talk about it. Let's figure it out. Where, where is what's one world? You know, let's, let's act as one people. Um, I don't expect peace. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a realist too. I don't expect it. I just want fairness. I want fairness in conversation. I think that's, that's, I think that's fair to ask for. Fairness in conversation. I could have said it better. Uh, before we do run out of time, I just want to ask any final thoughts from any of our, our participants. All right, seeing none, then I would say, Steve, we're still good on time, right? Yes, we're great on time. Very good, then I wanna yeah. talk a little bit about what's coming up on March 5th. Uh, our next diversity event will center on the celebration of women's history. And among our special guests, we have already confirmed Stephanie Adroni, Vice President of News for NBC Bay Area, Pamela Young, 12-time Emmy winner and our chapter vice president from Hawaii, who I believe is on this call today. Hi, Pam. And Sarah Ivey, someone that I want to introduce you to, a retired veteran television journalist living now in Dallas, Texas. She and I are friends. We started out together in a variety of places, and she has agreed to share her personal recollections of being harassed and ridiculed by men in television newsrooms earlier in her career. Before we finish today, any thoughts about Women's History Month and what more we should be talking about? 
I will say thank you to Sarah and all of the others who have come before that made it so that I don't feel that discrimination in that way. Very good. Thank you for that. Anyone else? All right, Steve, Steve, do you have any final thoughts? We haven't heard your voice in this whole conversation. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm just listening and um, and I share something that Dan Ashley said earlier as, as a white male. Uh, I'm always a little bit intimidated to get into this discussion and, and not wanting to say the wrong thing. But this idea of, of getting woke and, and I feel like as I evolve uh, my understanding of race and, and these issues, uh, I become more and more woke and I understand what that term means. And the more I wanna be an ally and an advocate uh, for diversity, uh, Bob and I have had many discussions around this topic. And for me, I just don't wanna say the wrong things or do the wrong things and I need education. And I think programs like this, I'm very, very happy for all of your participation. You all said incredible things, things that I cannot say uh, and, and communicate out to the world, to a larger world, uh, really important discussion. And I'm really, really overjoyed that we're able to do this program and, and thank you, Bob. And thank you all the participants. Well, thank you, Steve. And thank you for editing that open together. Cause I, I sent him all of those zoom interviews that I did with each of you. And I said, now let's make sense out of this. And he edited that down beautifully. So congratulations, Steve. I want to shout out to Patty, too, who's been feeding me information. And uh, thank you for your leadership and helping us as overviewer of the membership for Natus in San Francisco, for helping me understand how to talk about diversity and to be open and honest and very candid. I enjoy doing it, and I appreciate your support. One last thought I'm supposed to tell everyone is thank you to the viewers. Of course, those of you who've put in messages but are just sitting back and watching, and those of you who are going to watch on video from, in the future. Feel free right now, if you would, to share your thoughts and suggestions via social media or emails to office.mesf.tv. That would be office at MESF. That's there you go. I knew I did that wrong. I never could say that right. Office at MESF.tv. Excellent. It's on recorded now. So just go by that last <laughs> one and you'll find everybody. And then my final thoughts are these. The San Francisco chapter, NorCal, of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, hopes that these monthly interactions are groundbreaking for a digital safe space for opening eyes and minds and hearts about important diversity issues in our industry. Truth telling always matters. It's what we do and why people rely on us. By sharing our unique stories and experiences, we truly hope to make a positive difference in our profession by simply being heard, understood, and included on all levels to help forge meaningful connections, not only with our communities, but with our colleagues in our workplace. You all have done a wonderful job today of getting us started. I can't thank you all enough. And please, we're gonna rotate in a lot of new people over each month, but you all are always welcome as ambassadors of the program. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll say goodbye to everyone and wish all of you a good weekend. Stay safe, stay well, and come back in March and see what we do next.